I grew up the son of some entrepreneurs, small business owners, uh, who were both uh, coming out of kind of generational poverty in the delta of Arkansas, moved to Little Rock, and I didn't realize the impact that had on me until I actually started uh, my job in the work world. Actually, I had a pretty hard time in the school world because it doesn't function like entrepreneurs like to function. I mean, a semester is so long. How can it, why spread it out over that long? Why not just get a class done in three, four days, or maybe a week, right? So I got into the work world and I actually found some things that I was pretty good at and a bunch of things I wasn't good at. But one of the things I was quite good at was solving problems. It turned out that my mind functioned kind of like an entrepreneur and I would always try to understand what's the problem that's going on here and then how do we solve the problem? And so I'll, I'll rewind, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how I came to faith real quick because that, that's how I came to faith. I, I was around church, I grew up in Arkansas, right? I went to 12 years of parochial school. I um, found a good looking girl that went to a, uh, to a mainline denominational church in high school. And so I went to a mainline denominational church, not knowing what that meant, right? When I was in high school. So I was around all of these stories, yet I wasn't a Christian because I didn't understand the problem that Jesus came to solve. And it wasn't until I was in my 30s, actually with that mindset, it was finally the problem that clicked for me. I was like, oh my goodness, wait a minute, I'm really in trouble. I'm a moral criminal. I've broken the law, and I know what needs to happen for real justice to happen. Oh, and that's why Jesus came. And I felt pretty ignorant and then pretty fortunate on the other side of my decision at that point. But that's how I came to faith. That's also how I got engaged uh, while I was at Fidelity, the, my old business, in prison ministry. The only guy that I had ever known of that went to prison apparently had become a Christian. And in my world, if you claimed to be that, you were one. Because you were automatically kind of outing yourself as crazy. You had divorced yourself from reason, was the world that I grew up in, and, and definitely the one that I worked in. And so only those that really meant it claimed it. Right? And most folks didn't claim it because they didn't want the, um, the poor thoughts of their coworkers. And so I had heard that he had become a Christian. In my world, that was a pretty big deal. And so I wanted to go visit him. And he was having something called a clemency hearing, which meant that friends and family could go as he was asking mercy of the government for a, um, a reduction in sentence. And so I went in, and I had this experience with God while I was in prison then. And that was back in 04, 2004. And while I was there, I met many people for the very first time, not only my friend, but many of his friends inside of Wrightsville Prison. And I got to start to understand by talking with his mom and his dad about the problems that he and some of his friends that were getting out of prison were having. And so again, with this entrepreneurial deal, I kept trying to understand what's the problem that they're facing? Why is this prison thing that I don't understand, why, why is it such a problem? And so I started serving along with some friends of mine inside of a Little Rock prison in 2005, August 2005, bringing the only solutions I knew to the, um, to the problem, which were apologetics, philosophy. Uh, it, does anyone not know what apologetics is? We're on a Christian campus, and y'all are probably all grown up in church and know what I'm talking about. Right? Good. I didn't know what that word was when I was growing up. Uh, and then manhood. What is a man and how a man should act? So we started with, that was our solution. And very quickly, we started gaining favor within the government. And we started building some pretty close relationships. And this was over about a year and a half to the point where we were serving. We had groups of people serving in many prisons in central Arkansas. And we had many relationships within um, the leadership of the Department of Corrections that my church asked me to leave my business and if I would come on staff and run missions. If I would do what I was doing in prison at a more global level. So how would the church impact the world locally and globally? And I did that for nine and a half years and just left in January 1. And I left that job, which uh, I like very much, to run something called Restore Hope. And that was because of something that the governor said. Let me read it to you. 
my eyes are getting a little old. So I'm going to put my glasses on. But at the end of this summit that we ran last year, the governor got up after inviting the faith community to, uh, to a summit, to a uh, conference with the government. He said, I have no desire to convene this Restore Hope Summit and leave here only with hope. We need to follow that with action, commitment, measuring sticks, determining how we've done, how we're growing, how many more are joining the effort, what progress we're making. And I'm asking today for the steering committee to follow up and to see how we can measure our progress. Now, I have been engaged in prison ministry since 05 and in foster care since 06. I had the privilege of serving on the board of a foster care organization called The Call, Children of Arkansas Love for a Lifetime. Has anyone here heard of that? Back here, back here. So Children of Arkansas Love for a Lifetime, uh, in the world of investment in Christian uh, social missions, I think has one of the best ROIs for all you business students, right? There's a great return on investment in Arkansas for the call. It has local leadership. It's got statewide governance in uh, partnership with the government. And 50% of all foster parents that served in the state of Arkansas last year, nine years after the launch of the call, came through the churches in Arkansas, trained and mobilized by the call. And so they serve in their church, but there's a nonprofit in their community with local leadership and partnership with the state agency that trains them and mobilizes them for the Christian mission of serving as foster parents. See Dr. Andrew Baker. Right. Um, and so when the governor said that, I had this relationship with the call in foster care. I had a long relationship with prison, and I knew the struggles that we were at. But until the governor said that, I want to see how we can turn this into initiative. I'd actually not ever thought about the larger problem that we're facing in Arkansas. Let me um, hit a couple of stats for you real quick so you understand what the problem is. Uh, quickly, the prisons in Arkansas are the fastest growing. The last two years, we had the fastest growing prisons in Arkansas. We pay about $24,000 a year. I don't know how much you pay to come to Harding per year, but I happen to know what the room and board on tuition is for the U of A at Fayetteville, and it's less than that by about 6 k Recidivism is about 1 in 2, so 50%. Recidivism is the tracking of an individual when they get out of prison within the three years of their release, what's the likelihood that they'll be back incarcerated? 50% ain't good. Right? It's awful. Especially when we're talking about, one, the social problem that we have. These are people that have families. Their moms, their dads, their aunts, their uncles, their kids, right? All care and love about them. They'd be mad at them, right? And trying to figure out how to reconcile with them. But we've got a big social problem. Number two, Fiscally, $24,000 a year next year, it'll be $25,000 a year, which will make math easy for a year. But the year after, it'll be $26,000 a year. So next year, we, at least I have an easy time with math at $25K a year. Uh, on the foster care side of things, we don't have enough foster parents. Even though the call raised up 50% of all foster um, homes that served last year, we still only have 0.6 beds available for every kid coming into care. When I started serving in foster care, we had an average of about 3,800 kids in care per year. Nine years later, it's 4,700. When I started serving nine years ago, we had about 500 kids that had parental rights terminated. They are orphaned, and they're here in the state of Arkansas, and uh, the average is now 650. And so the problem's growing faster than we can actually solve it. But when the governor said, I want to turn it into an initiative, that was the very first time I'd ever thought What's the solution to that problem? Our problems are growing faster, but if the governor actually wants to turn it into an initiative, he is the one unique individual in the state of Arkansas that actually can direct all of the agencies to the same goal. And so I sat down. I was actually quite troubled. I, I served on the steering committee for the governor, and I knew that we were just pulling off an event. And so he kind of surprised me at the end when he said, hey, listen, I, I don't want to leave here just with an event. I want to actually do something bigger on this thing. And so um, my intent for the next several weeks was to do a little research, write a paper, and send it to the governor with my advice on what I think you should do or have others do 
to achieve the goal that you said that you wanted to achieve. And, um, and so he liked it a whole lot and asked me to like go do it, which was not something I was planning to do. But so I left my job and I started a new nonprofit. Um, and so here's the big thing that I want to leave you with is here's how our community works. It's that top arrow and you can see all the arrows in between. So imagine this top arrow is we want to help families who are at risk, right? We want to help families at risk, and so we've got all these agencies. All these little arrows would be your nonprofits in your community, it'd be your government agencies in your community, and everyone is doing uh, different things. No one is actually working together. In fact, if you were to take a look at our criminal justice system, it's a series of silos in which work is done in a silo and then kind of tossed over to the next silo. So our cops make decisions on the street to the best of their ability. They uh, charge someone, arrest them, and they charge them with a crime, and they toss it to the prosecutor and defense attorney who work with a judge, and they find out what they're going to do, who then toss the work over to the Department of Corrections, who then toss the work to the community, none of whom are actually ready for the work that's coming to them because there is no grand strategy. And so uh, we actually are starting with Restore Hope. We're going to bring tools and a process to a community to allow them to engage in something called a collective impact initiative. If you Google collective impact, you'd find a paper in 2011 written by the Stanford Social Review that kind of lays out exactly what that means. But the big idea is that a community, we have community problems, and the community has to have the ability with a process and some tools to actually work together to achieve the goals that they want. A criminal justice system has to work in some coherent strategic way to get the outcomes we want. And as a community, we pick three outcomes for someone that commits a crime at the severity of a felony. Right? What can we do? Interactive part. Three things we could do to someone committing a felony. Someone give me one. Come on, you're selling drugs to my kids, and the, I call the cops, and they come and get you, and they arrest you, and what are you going to go? Where are you going? Yeah, you're going to go to prison. All right. Has no one in here actually been around bad people or been bad? <laughs> you all seem so ignorant of this. <laughs> That's a good thing, by the way. So we've got three things we can do in a community. right? We can execute someone. We can incarcerate them forever. We'll just incapacitate them. And, um, and that's it, you'll die in prison. Or we can engage in correcting behavior. And it's that correcting behavior part that we're failing at in Arkansas. And so adults are making decisions for whatever reason that are bad. They go to prison and their kids go into foster care. And neither actually are having their behaviors, there's not a vision and tools, this is where the church comes in, right, to actually help someone who's ready behave in a way that would be pro-social or good for the community. But that's what we're seeking to do is put together all the um, players in the criminal justice system, including the nonprofits and churches in the community, having a common strategy and uh, for the betterment, we think we can actually close that uh, execution gap. <laughs>